What is Carrion? It is an indie game that most, or well, some people, might not have necessarily heard of, unless of course you follow Devolver Digital, which you definitely should. But it's a game that's very unique and definitely had to be an indie game. Now, what is it? It is a uh, 2D pixel art metroidvania. But one key difference with this particular game is that it asks a question that has long been asked. What does it mean to be a monster? The devs cleverly describe the game as being a reverse horror game, and that is one of the most apt descriptors I've ever heard. So, let's get into how this game crafts its monster so well, because that needs to be analysed. This game needs to get a lot more attention for what it's been able to do, and yes, this video will go into gameplay and narrative spoilers, but I would say that those things should make you more interested in playing rather than dissuading you from it. So let's get into it. The design of the monster. You can't start a discussion about how a monster is crafted in a visual narrative without first looking at the overall visual design of the creature. The monster itself is a swarm of flesh and teeth with tentacles that protrude in every direction, breaking through its body as it splutters around a room. The game itself has a pixel art 2D style, and so it doesn't look realistic or anything quite as boring as that, but this also kind of obfuscates the monster. And obfuscate may be a pretentious word, but it kind of works here. The pixelated style makes it that you can't see the monster all that clearly. You just see this endlessly moving hunk of meat thrashing around in every direction, never staying still, always in motion, and yet seemingly always crawling around. The design of this monster creates an image of something ungodly, something unreal, something that you might find in a body horror movie somewhere, but with one specific difference. You see, much of the time in media, terrifying and misshapen monstrosities don't look all that great when we see them too much. There's a reason that many horror films hide and or obscure the appearance of a monster. A monster in your imagination is so much scarier than one that's drawn. This is why the creatures in something like the works of H.P. Lovecraft can always be imagined as these mangled leviathans. But as soon as they're illustrated, they just... Well, they just aren't scary. But because this creature is not too clear and is instead pixelated with a mass of tiny interlocking 2D squares, you always find yourself imagining what it would look like in real life rather than doing that thing we all do when we see a monster in a horror movie. Because we all just say, ah, doesn't look real. You can't say that here, it's thrashing around and squirming when you leave the controller or mouse and keyboard alone. It continues in a looping animation, just, just writhing. It's a perfect body horror monster. And in addition, we know what this monster would look like in the real world. Well, well sort of. Devolver Digital, the game's publisher, use the live-action version of the monster in some of its advertisements for Carrion. Now, Devolver Digital is known for doing all its advertising in a self-referential and jokey way, but here's what it looks like. It's clearly just a guy in a suit, but of course, that's just an advert rather than the actual game, but still fine. And just one last thing. This is the main menu when you start up the game, so at least the devs realized that they needed to make things just that tad but unsettling before things even kicked off, and kudos to them. The movement of the monster. The monster looks like wriggling meat, but guess what? It also moves like wriggling meat. Now, we have already touched on how even when you're not moving, as in when you're not pushing a button to get it slithering somewhere, the monster never actually stays truly still. It's always just shivering and swirling. But then you start actually moving in a direction, and I mean any direction, whether it's along the floor, up walls, or on the roof, this thing can go anywhere. First off, it just feels good to control. You can push yourself in any direction, and you can go there. There's no jumping to get up platforms or anything like that. You simply go in the direction you want to go, and the creature will shoot tentacles out in that general direction as it drags the 
hulking mass that is its body towards whatever you want to kill. And while this does feel great, because almost all games force you into accepting the dull reality of that pesky force of nature known as gravity, you gain full movement here. But gravity, which usually forces game characters into walking along the ground and occasionally getting to jump somewhere, well, gravity is still present. You see, while you can go in every direction and the hideous mass of flesh will move in that direction, gravity is still there. You will see that gravity does pull the creature downwards, but if you're stuck to a ceiling, then gravity just kind of leaves you dangling there, swaying there like a sickly beast. And to make movement even more satisfying, the creature leaves some of itself behind as it moves. Blood trails follow you as you slam your body into the walls and the floor. You'll find pieces of yourself left behind, dripping from the structures that you forced yourself through. It's just so satisfying to move. And that just isn't all that common. How often do you have fun just moving a character around? How often does it feel satisfying to just move? To watch as the creature swings across the screen as those tentacles flail out and grab a hold of whatever is nearby. It feels so different to almost everything else and that makes it stand out far more than any other game that sees you controlling some kind of a monster. The attacks of the monster. But if you thought that the movement of the monster was satisfying, then you have another thing coming because the combat is exactly what this game needed. Many games place you into the body of a character who has full control of themselves, who can aim precisely or who can slash with finesse. But this monster is not like that. This monster cannot control itself all that well because, well, it has no eyes and it has no skin. It doesn't have arms or legs or seemingly any way of being precise. And so, uh... Well, how do you think the monster attacks? Because it attacks like this. This thing doesn't know how to be calm. This thing just flies into a room and thrashes around in every direction. Never mind quietly picking off enemies or strategically eliminating certain threats. You generally just fly into a room and throw everyone around until they're dead. Just throw them into walls and eat them and yank them through vents. Just cause mayhem as weak little humans scream and try to escape you. Murdering people in this game feels like being a monster, a monster that can't think, a monster that just wants to get out and devour everything in its path. But while you will generally be an imprecise murderous beast, there is a certain degree of control that you have. Sure, when you enter a room filled with regular humans, you will probably just fly into the room and flail around wildly until everything's either definitely dead or definitely in your mouth. But sometimes you do get to be a bit more strategic, such as when dealing with special enemies, like those that have uh, shields or flamethrowers. Because flamethrowers set your entire body on fire and they're extremely dangerous. And for those enemies, you need to be even more like a monster in a horror. You hide in the vents or under grates, you shoot out from behind a wall when their backs are turned, and then you smash them into the ground over and over again. It's visceral and clumsy, but when you're a hulking monstrosity, you need to kill people as quickly and effectively as possible so that they can't shoot you or set you on fire. Because despite being a gigantic mass of flesh and teeth, you can die rather quickly and easily. But despite that, combat makes you more deadly because with every enemy you kill, you get stronger. I mean, how does a monster regain health, for instance? Well, by eating the corpses of their foes, of course. So you can devour all of your enemies to regain your strength, and so you're rewarded for playing aggressively. You're rewarded for dashing at the enemy and tearing them to shreds as quickly as possible, so that they don't have a chance to hurt you. And the faster you clear a room full of enemies, the more like a monster you seem. Although enemy drones and mechs put a bit of a damper on that, seeing as you can't exactly eat them. But at least the way to destroy them is to either grab a drone and smash it against every surface in sight until it stops flying. And with mechs, you need to rip the roof off it so you can grab the tasty human hiding within. So those poor people aren't even safe when they hide behind machines. Another reason I'd say that this combat works just so well is because you can imagine this creature as a more feral, animalistic beast. It's like nothing alive, it's unlike human animals and non-human animals, but it's definitely a beast. It's clearly intelligent, based on the things it can do, but not a human kind of intelligence. It's a kind of intelligence that knows how to cause damage. 
and it's clearly smart enough to know it doesn't want to be in this facility, it's been locked inside. But you can't really see its actions as evil in any sense. When you play something like Overlord or GTA 5, you know you're playing as a villain and you're doing bad things. But when you play Carrion and you devour humans, you don't see it as doing bad, but rather just doing what the monster does. It doesn't observe your petty little morals because it's too busy being hungry and imprisoned. It wants out and it wants to eat everything on its way out. It thrashes because it doesn't know how to be precise. But that just adds to how you see this creature as a monstrosity that has no other purpose than get out of this place and kill everything that stands in your way. It just wants to get out and it will pummel you into the floor before eating you if that means it can have a meal, restore some of its biomass, heal and then get the hell out of that place. The sound of the monster. Ooh, the sounds this creature makes. The monster is always moving and it has this sickly persistent ambience. Like sticky arms of glue as it clings along the ceiling, shattering lights as it moves, or roars as it breaks its way through doors, or anguish squeals as it gets set alight and starts to burn to death, or the screams of its enemies as they meet their fate. But saying all of this means nothing, you need to hear it for yourself. So just listen. Now isn't that just perfect? The sound designers on this game knew exactly what they were doing and they deserve all the praise for what they managed to create. The growth of the monster. So you know what the monster sounds like and how it moves and what it looks like, but Carrion is still a game. And in this particular case it's a Metroidvania game. For those unfamiliar with this uncreatively named genre, it's a game with a focus on exploration and interconnectedness. The map is generally filled with locations you cannot enter until you have access to a specific ability. For instance, in many such games you might unlock a double jump that can help you get to higher places, or you might get an ability that allows you to break down a certain wall or door or something like that. And Carrion is no exception to that, However, the abilities that you gain as you grow are a bit more on theme. No double jump for you. Instead, while you start to gain the ability to do things like shooting a web at enemies that ensnares them in a sticky trap, an ability to do a dash that can break through certain walls, a form of invisibility that lets you get nice and close to some humans and then just reappear, or the ability to grow spikes all over your body. All of these serve progression-based purposes, like allowing you to break through wooden walls or the ability to slip past laser beams. But their implementation is generally so monstrous that they fit this beast well. Probably the most disgusting of the things you can do is the ability to turn yourself into a swarm of worms when you enter water. And they look rather gross as they swirl around. And the most powerful one that really unleashes the power of a monster that's no longer hiding in the shadows sends spears of sharp flesh 
into a direction of your choosing, skewering anyone who happens to be in the way. But that's only available to a fully grown monster, because you see, another ability of the monster which only further adds to its otherworldly nature is the ability to leave parts of itself behind. Sometimes you can find a pool of water somewhere and you can leave a big sack of flesh behind if you need to make yourself smaller. Now why would you make yourself smaller? Well abilities like invisibility are only available to the monster at its smallest and the barrage of spears is only available to the monster at its biggest. And of course you can only grow in size by either eating corpses or by finding a hive which serves the technical purpose of being a save point, but it's also where you've built yourself a fleshy nest, which allows you to gobble up some more biomass when it's needed. So just the thought that you aren't a whole thing, but rather some kind of a colony of teeth and mouths is a bit on the upsetting side of things. Not to mention the fact that one of your abilities allows you to enter the body of a human and take control of it to use it and then once you're done with it you burst out of the human's body. But it really is best to just show what can be done rather than talking about it. Bloody and darkly beautiful, but before we can move on, it really must be mentioned that when the devs crafted this monster, they also made it the bigger you are, the harder you are to control. Now, no matter your size, you can always get through tight spaces, but it can be difficult to maneuver your way in. So you're just a mass of flesh squeezing and clawing its way through the world. Fun fun! The environment of the monster. So while the monster is fun fun, the actual environment at which it finds itself is a bit less fun fun. But it is functional and narratively on point. The environment is mostly an underground facility of some sort in the middle of a city, which you can first see relatively early on in the game during one particular level. So that isn't much of a spoiler. Now the environment is very functional, it's just a set of interconnected areas with a pixel art style, like the monster itself, and so it isn't going to be winning any awards for graphics. But you do learn a little bit about the monster through the world it's in. At the beginning of the game, you're in a vat that you break out of, and so it's rather simple to deduce that you were either captured or engineered in a lab, and you've now gotten out. Hence why all the environments are full of signs telling people to beware of the monster that's on the loose. And all that simple environmental storytelling stuff and if you want to learn more about that, check out my video about Metro 2033 and environmental storytelling. I'll put a link in the description. Now, sure, I don't think much of an environmental storytelling discussion is needed here, but the devs did decide to do something interesting about the monster's traversal of that environment. You don't get a map. For those familiar with the Metroidvania genre, you should know that all of those games give you a map and sometimes a mini-map too, and that they can help you with traversal, but not in Carrion. You don't get a map because you're a dangerous monster that's thrashing its way through the world. You don't have a map. You just slither your way towards the nearest door or crack in the wall. It makes complete sense for there to not be a map. But from a player's perspective, it does make navigation rather confusing. So while you can criticize that decision from a gameplay perspective, because I certainly would have spent less time running in circles if I'd had a map, but you've got to admit that it does make more sense for this monster to not have a map. It's just causing mayhem and killing its way through a facility. It doesn't have a PDA like every other video game protagonist. The story of the monster. And here's where we get to the spoiler territory, but really who cares? 
this game is mostly about the gameplay. And if you couldn't figure out that by the end of the game, you get out of the facility, then I don't know what to say. You start off stuck in there, and then you will obviously end it by getting out of there. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. The game is obviously about a monster that's trying to get out of this place. But there is a mild story at play here. Every now and then you find a special doorway that gives you a flashback. Although, based on the ending, I don't know if it's actually a flashback or more of an anticipation or flash forward. Doesn't matter though. In those sections you play as a man and that man is investigating a facility that's in massive disrepair and eventually that man gets infected with something and goes back to the extraction helicopter. Once there, the biosensors realize he's not a human and that's when the monster bursts out of him and yeah, so that's possibly meant to be how the monster got caught in the first place. It's somewhat vague, but through the storytelling they never actually tell you where the monster came from, what it is, why it is. You're left with an air of mystery, and that's how all the greatest monsters are. Once you learn more and more about them, they become less and less interesting. And yes, I'm talking to you alien franchise copyright holders. The ending of the monster. Alright, so we've gotten to the end of the tale of the monster, and there is, I suppose, one last thing to spoil. But it really isn't that big a deal. I mean, you knew that the monster was going to escape the facility the whole time, and there's also never a word of dialogue in this game, so it's definitely more gameplay focused than anything else. At the end, you gain your final ability, which allows you to completely take over a body. And then you walk that body to some bioscanners, and they recognize you as human, and you simply walk out the front door. And then it pans upwards to show that you're in the middle of a city that appears to be in quarantine. Which is a great way to end things, because it just leaves you with the question, what is the monster going to do next? And hopefully the devs don't make a sequel, because that ending is nice and ambiguous. Does it end up killing more people, growing bigger and bigger, killing all the humans, or does it end up being shot with something big and just dying? Both situations would likely be disappointing if they showed them. But they don't show them, and so all's well. You can just imagine what might happen next, and your imagination is always going to be better than whatever they can come up with. And that is a fantastic ending. You're just left with that question. And that is a suitable end for a monster. You have no idea whether or not it's going to survive, but it certainly is going to take a few people with it. The ending of the video. And that is the end of the video. I know. I spoiled everything. But here's the thing. Even though I did, you know, maybe spoil all the upgrades and the design and sound and everything. This game is still definitely, definitely worth your time. It's just watching it isn't the same as, as actually playing it for yourself. And I would really just recommend people play it. Try it. It's it's something it's something different. It's something it's something just unlike kind of anything else. You don't really get games where you get to play as a monster. And so yes, I might have spoiled the whole thing, but really, you have to play it for yourself. Some games are just like that. And so, you should... Did you hear that? I think. Uh -huh.